let's do this. Howdy! We're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum unit. This is on our um, an abbreviated version of our light and color unit that we normally do. But I have a fun little, you know, um, comic here to get us started. He says, wow, this is great. If I hold these mirrors just right, I can see an army of me's all in a row. Jason's as far as the eye can see. Gosh, there are billions of me's. A veritable sea of genetic perfection. And there's you, sitting speechless and alone in the shadow of our mighty presence. Kind of makes you feel piddly and insignificant, doesn't it? But I should think you're used to that by now. I should think I'd be used to you by now. Oh, they must be siblings living in quarantine there. All right. So let's get started. The electromagnetic spectrum. Basic things we need to know about light is the way to start. So light is a form of energy. It travels in a straight line. It has a speed of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. It is carried by little packets of energy, which we call photons. That's a vocabulary word you'll need to know. It can travel through a vacuum, so it doesn't require a medium, which makes it um, a, it is a transverse wave in the fact that it vibrates uh, perpendicular to the direction that it's traveling. But it's also an electromagnetic wave in the fact that it can travel through a vacuum. So transverse wave, remember, was perpendicular. So you should make sure that you know that. Electromagnetic means it didn't require a medium to travel through, which is why it can travel through a vacuum, which is a really good thing because otherwise we wouldn't get the light of the sun um, we, to us because of the fact that it wouldn't have any particles to travel to, through the universe to get to us. So, um, but you do need to write down photon as a uh, vocabulary word. It is a packet of energy that carries light. So it is the light, a bunch of photons carry light. Also notice I did put the word light in the order of the visible spectrum. That's the only part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see. And it does always go in the order of Roy G. Biv, which is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So here is the electromagnetic spectrum. This is a wide variety of information. But the basic electromagnetic spectrum is radio waves, microwaves, infrared waves, visible light rays, ultraviolet rays, x-rays, and gamma rays. The way that I always remember the electromagnetic spectrum is I have a little acronym or a little saying, and that saying is Red Martians Invaded Vegas Using an X-Ray Gun. And I know it's kind of weird, but um, it's a way to remember the order of the electromagnetic spectrum and the fact that um, I can have it to where... I, I say that. So let me see if I can write on my screen here. So red Martians invaded Vegas using x-ray guns. So each one of those letters is um, the first letter of our electromagnetic spectrum. It corresponds. So red would go with radio, Martians would go with microwaves, um, invaded would go with infrared, Vegas is full of lights that we can see, so I like it for visible, and then ultraviolet would be our using, x-rays, obviously x-ray, and then guns would be our gamma rays. You'll notice on this slide also that the radio waves have the longest wavelengths and that as we go this direction from left to right across the screen that the wavelengths get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, if you look here at the bottom instead, and it looks like my little recording thing popped up, so let me bring it down for a minute, then um, you'll notice that the frequencies though go up and up and up. 
remember that all of this uh, works because all of these different types of light, radio, gamma, doesn't matter which ones, all travel at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So as the wavelength goes up, the frequency goes down and vice versa. Because remember, our formula for that was V equals F times lambda, where lambda was our wavelength and F was our frequency. So as the frequency goes up, the wavelength has to go down because the speed stays the same because the speed is always 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. You'll also notice the sizes, you know, um, we gave examples here of how that works. So these are all things that you should be putting into your notes if you have them, if you're, as you're writing them. Okay, and we'll click forward. Electromagnetic wave. Since light is an electromagnetic wave, we've already talked about this. It's really just a wave that's able to travel through a vacuum, so it doesn't require a medium, and it has electric and magnetic fields with different wavelengths, um, but it does travel as a transverse wave. Notice that this diagram has it as a transverse wave, and one is a magnetic field wave, and one is a electric field wave, and they do travel actually perpendicular to each other when they create this. So it's kind of interesting that way. We still will need to know the wave speed equation where uh, V equals F times lambda, but now we're going to substitute the V for a C, and that is because C stands for the speed of light. And so we'll say C equals F times lambda, where F is our frequency, lambda is our wavelength, and C is our speed of light, which we know to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So this is another way of looking at it. This electromagnetic spectrum is actually backwards. So just realize that as you read it from left to right, it's backwards from how we normally read it. Also notice that your visible spectrum is broken out here. And so whereas we said earlier that it was Roy G. Biv, um, now that is just backwards. So it's Roy... kind of where that is. So it's Roy, and that's actually still kind of red, isn't it? I'll put that orange over here. Roy G. Biv. So as not only did we have the red Martians invaded Vegas using x-ray guns to remember the order, we also have Roy G. Biv, which fits into that order for our visible light spectrum. But as we look across the screen here, we do see how, um, yeah, we're doing good on time. I just want to make sure I was still recording. So on this picture, the frequency increases from the radio waves to the grand gamma rays, always. It also, the wavelength increases from the gamma rays to the radio waves. So notice that's an inverse relationship as one increases, the other decreases since they're going opposite directions. And the energy always matches the frequency. You do need to know that. As the energy increases, the frequency also increases. So that will always go that the radio waves are the least energetic and the gamma rays are the most energetic. And that's because they're the most penetrating as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that in light in just a little bit. So objects can be two, three things with light. They can either be transparent, meaning they let light completely through, which is like this glass over here on our left side. They can be translucent, which is more like the glass on the... Um, right side, that's kind of like your shower door glass. It kind of scatters the light as it comes through, but it allows some light through. That's what translucent means. And then we can have something that's opaque. And our little Martian guy underneath both of the glasses, because believe it or not, there's one underneath both of those glasses, he's opaque. He doesn't light, let light travel through at all. So light can either be absorbed or reflected or transmitted and that is because of the type of material that it actually has we can also call um, these would be you could call something illuminated 
if we shine light on it, so all of these objects, we have light shining on them, so they're illuminated, or something can be luminous. And if something is luminous, that means it produces its own light. Neon signs, for example, give off their own light, so they would be luminous. Those are vocabulary words again. So luminous gives off light. Illuminated means light is shown on it. You laying on the beach is, is an example of being illuminated because you're lit up. So ultraviolet light oscillates at too high of a frequency for the electrons in the glass molecules. And um, infrared light is too low. So visible light is just right, and that is why plants can grow inside. But you can't typically get sunburnt or get really hot inside your house from the sun itself. And that is because your glass is made out of molecules that vibrate at a certain frequency. And the only ones that really vibrate at the right frequency to go through the glass are visible light. But infrared light, if you have energy efficient glass, won't be able to get through and that's why your house doesn't heat up. And ultraviolet light can't go through either and that's because that's why you won't get sunburned just standing inside the window and on a sunny day. So glass is transparent to visible light, but it's opaque to infrared and ultraviolet because it won't let um, ultraviolet and infrared through, but it is transparent to visible light because it does let it through. So that's really the information you really, really need to know probably for your form, but I wanted to make sure that I also talk a little bit about color specifically because I think it's really cool to talk about color because there's a lot of interesting information about it. So again, the visible spectrum is our Roy G. Biv, and we have our long wavelengths and low frequencies at red light. And then we have violet at the very end, and it has short wavelengths but very high frequencies. So that's kind of that general thought process that as we go from left to right, the wavelengths decrease, but as we go from left to right, the frequencies increase. And remember, that's to keep them all the same speed. So what is color? Well, color is actually... Um, largely in part of how objects interact with light. Ultimately, it is what light they absorb versus what they reflect back into our eyes. What color we see is really what is reflected versus what's transmitted into the object itself. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about our eyes just because I like to talk about eyeballs. Um, so light comes into your eye, and it goes through the um, cornea, which is this first, this front part of your eye right here, and it's actually curved, and sometimes your cornea can be misshaped, and if it's misshaped, then you sometimes have something called astigmatism, and we'll talk about that when we get a little bit more into um, lenses when we're talking about light. Then we have, right behind the cornea, we have our lens, right? And then on the back part of your eyeball, you have this film, um, and it's our retina. And it's actually where all of the cells are attached to see color. And those are called our cones and our rods. And the cones actually allow you to see color, but the rods allow you to see the different shades of color because they're actually our black and white perceptors. Okay, this is actually a magnified picture of cones and rods. The cone and rod cells are magnified here 45,000 times larger than they normally are. The broader ones right here that are kind of yellowish. They're actually our cone cells and they see the color. And then the thinner ones, notice there's a lot of those, are the rods. And that's why we can actually see things as long as there's a little bit of light and there's shadows and things like that. We actually can see that. Um, things like owls, um, nocturnal animals, their rods and cones, or they don't have very many cones. They might have some, but they have a lot less because they need to be able to really perceive that black and white image and distinguish things between that. So just so you know, that's your eyeball. But this actual back, um, the retina part, so that is actually where um, all of these cells lay. And if, um, yeah, so we'll go into that one. 
So we actually don't see all colors the same. There is a sensitivity test that you can, that we, our, our eyes is, are sensitive to things. Believe it or not, this is the whole reason why uh, when the lights on the uh, stoplights change, they go from green to yellow and then to red because the sensitivity actually is to green and yellow more than it is red. So if it just went straight from green to red, we wouldn't be as, as sensitive to that. But we are sensitive to certain colors. Eyes are actually most sensitive to the mid-range, which is near about 555 nanometers. And that is our green-yellow spectrum for wavelengths. So if I look at both of those light bulbs and I said, which one do you see first or which one pops out to you more, probably the yellow one does. It actually appears brighter even though they're both 40-watt light bulbs. The eye just does not see the red light the same way as it does the yellow. We have three types of cones in our eyes, actually, and it's the same as the pixels in a TV, okay? And so those are short range, which is the blue, and medium, which is the yellow green, and then long, which is the red. The combination of the blue, green, yellow range, and red is what creates all the different colors that we see. Some people who are colorblind, a certain color doesn't work properly in their cones. Like they might just be blue-green colorblind, which would mean they'd only see like reds and blacks and whites and shades of those. And so, and they might see some yellows, but they wouldn't see any of the blues or the indigos or the greens colors. And so that's kind of one of those thought processes of if the rods don't, if the cones don't work properly. Notice the rods actually fall in this range right here of sensitivity that they're more in that yellow, green, blue, warm kind of middle range value. So how we see light, there are three primary colors of light. And like I said, they are red, green, and blue, which is the same as the pixels on a TV. As they come together, they produce white light. So the absence of those colors is black. But also, as they blend together, if you just see the red and the green together, then all the red and greens light up on your screen and you would see yellow. If you just see the blue and the red together, then you would see a screen of purple or magenta. And if you see the blue and the green together, you would see what's called cyan. It's kind of like a light blue or turquoise color. Okay. These are known as additive colors. The red, blue, and green are. Um, it's a little bit different than what they teach you in art class because art is about pigments and the, this is about talking about colors of light. Uh, if you work on the stage at the school for theater at all, this is how you create the different colors of the um, stage because as you put different filters on the lights, which all the lights have are typically these three colored filters of blue, red, and green. And so as you put the different, if you wanted a sunny scene, you'll just turn the red and green filters on. And so that's kind of one of those things. So red and green make yellow, red and blue make magenta, and blue and green make cyan. Magenta and yellow and cyan are known as our secondary colors uh, or our um, subtractive colors. Now there are three primary pigment colors, which happen to be the subtractive colors. So cyan, magenta, and yellow are our primary pigment colors. They are what paints and dyes are known as, and they are subtractive because as you put those together, you end up canceling all the color out and you get black. Whereas when we did red, blue, and green, notice we got all the color, we got white. So these are known as subtractive because you would get black. So red, in red paint, what primary colors are absorbed from the white light? Well, we get the green and the blue absorbed because the red is reflected and that's what we see. Okay, in green paint, what's absorbed? The blue and red. What's reflected? The green. So what we see is what's reflected and all the other colors are absorbed. So there's a lot of information about, there's a, there's a, um, an actual site you can go to and play with color filters. So these are the actual objects, but when you put a red filter on, this is what it looks like. When you put a green filter on, this is what it would look like. And when you put a purple filter on, this is what it would look like, or a magenta.
So again, it has to do with how the color will variate depending on what filter that you have. So the manner in which light interacts with an object is dependent on the frequency of the light that it strikes, that strikes it, and the nature of the atoms in the object themselves. Because this frequency of light as it hits here, some of it's going to be absorbed, some of it's going to be reflected. And then the nature of those atoms, that's what's going to cause the absorption or the reflection. What gets reflected is what we actually see. So are you colorblind? Again, colorblindness is that the cones in your eyes don't work properly. And so this very first one, everybody should be able to see the number 12 very easily because anybody with normal color vision or color vi or all colorblind deficiencies should be able to read this. But I'm going to put my next one and the next one if you there's certain numbers that depending on what you read, it'll depend on what if you are colorblind or not. So there's a, there's a number in there, and everybody should come up with a number that they see. Okay, People with normal color vision should see the number 8, but those that have yellow-green color deficiencies might see the number 3 instead. If you have total color blindness, you won't be able to read a number at all. So it's kind of an interesting little thing. If you want to do a larger color test, you can click on this right here. Okay. So why is the sky blue? These are always interesting comments to me, and these are some of the pictures that I took on a cruise one time. Um, I've been on a lot of cruises, but this was one of those pictures that I took when I was off on my cruise. Really, um, the sky is blue because small wavelength light, which is the blue-green light, from the sun is scattered by very small particles of dust, especially oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere. So it has to do with what's absorbed and scattered and what's allowed through and what's not. So a lot of it actually gets um, scattered, and so that's why you see the blue. The rest of it gets absorbed. So why are clouds white? There are small water droplet clusters that scatter the red light, while the larger clusters will scatter the blue. Together, this scattered light is then white because you're actually getting a little bit of the red light, you get a little bit of the blue-green light, and so even the larger clusters scatter both blue and green. So, again, the combination of red, blue, and green gets you white. Um, the water is blue-green here. This is actually a picture of Italy. I've never actually been to Italy, but it's... Um, the Carnival Freedom, which I have been on that boat, but obviously I didn't get to go this year. So, but um, water absorbs red light, but it reflects the blue green, which then makes it look kind of cyan color. So all the red gets absorbed. Froth is white because those tiny water droplets clusters will absorb and then re-radiate that uh, red light. So the red will then mix with the blue green that's already being reflected. So it produces white. This creature actually lives at the bottom of the ocean. The reason it is red is because it absorbed that red light. And so by the time all the, the light that got to it was red. So by the time it comes out and actually emits light, the only light that it was able to emit was red. Why are sunsets red? These are again some of my sunset pictures. Well, the atmosphere at sunset provides a much longer path through which sunlight from the sun has to travel or the white life has to travel. So what happens is the atmosphere scatters a large percentage of that blue part of the white light in all directions, leaving mainly just the red part of the light to reach our eyes when we see the sun. And so that's why it looks so much more orange, red, yellow towards the end of the day and at sunsets than the blue that we normally see because that blue has gotten scattered so much in all different directions. How do pigments work when we do paintings and pictures? So really, if you've ever had a, um, I used to have a printer that had to have a bunch of different um, cartridges on it. And those cartridges were always a red, a magenta, a yellow, a cyan, a blue, a green, and a black. Okay, so really if you want red, you're really just going to use your yellow and magenta paint. Lots of times it was just a yellow, a magenta, and a cyan that would actually be in the, the group as well. You could buy that particular uh, printer cartridge. 
And so then if you wanted yellow, then you just use the yellow printer cartridge. Green could be using the cyan and the yellows, and they would together make that green. Blue could be made by the cyan and magenta if you didn't have its own individual cartridge. And then cyan is just using the cyan paint. So. And then you could use yellow and blue, sorry, yellow, cyan, and magenta to make black, like for the beak. So these are color separation pictures. So if you just printed it in cyan, that's what it would look like. If you just printed it with magenta, that's what it would look like. If you just printed it with the yellow cartridge, it would look like this. And if you just printed it with the black cartridge, it would look like this. Once you overlay all of these and print it with all your cartridges, you get the actual colors that you see. All right. Hope this helps. You guys make sure you take care of your form and have a good one.